Good morning, church. Sure is good to see everyone out today. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. I appreciate all those who have stepped forward to lead us in prayer and praise. I appreciate Brother Bob's words around the table as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. It's so good that we can go to the scriptures at this time. And I'm very excited to be sharing with you a lesson this morning. The Living Word and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Living Word and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Brother Adam did a fine job in our scripture reading from John chapter 5. And there in that context, Jesus is sharing four witnesses to his identity as the Christ. But I want to highlight a particular one, and that is the scripture. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Even at the end of the chapter, in John chapter 5 and verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Jesus said that the scriptures testify to him, that they were all about him. Now then, if you'd been standing by in the multitude and listening to some of Jesus' teaching, how would you check up on that? What would you do about that? Well, if you were fair-minded, you'd go and look in the scriptures. But now, how would you go about that? There was no printing press. There was no internet. You couldn't go back to the hotel and find a Bible the Gideons had stashed in a drawer. How would you do that? You have to go to where the scriptures were. And in the first century, the scriptures were written on scrolls, rolled up and put away in jars. You'd have to go to where the jars were, maybe a library or a synagogue. Find the right jar, open it up, dig around for the right scroll, pick out the scroll, roll it this way, roll it that way, roll it the other way, until you found what you were looking for, truly searching the scriptures. Wouldn't it be incredible to see some of those actual scrolls? To see what scrolls looked like 2,000 years ago. And that, in part, is one of the amazing consequences of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. Beginning in 1947, a 2,000-year-old library was discovered, which contained the same canon, the same Hebrew Bible, the same books that we call the Old Testament, As we have, composing our Old Testament today, all of those books were there, many copies of them. But not only that, a bunch of other books besides. And what you had then was, here are scrolls dating to the time of Jesus and even before Jesus. These are the ones that people listening to him would have gone and searched. You could make a trip to Israel today and go to a particular museum called the Shrine of the Book, built in 1965, just to house the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you went in there, you would find all of these custom-made cases around the walls and freestanding where the rolls are kept and scrolls are kept and displayed in such a way as to protect them from the environment and other processes that would further decay them. And you go and look at scrolls and you're seeing the exact same pieces of parchment that Jews were reading and searching 2,000 years ago. The kind that they would go and search maybe after hearing a sermon by John the Baptist or one of the apostles or even Jesus Christ when he was preaching in their area. Jesus told people that the scriptures were all about him, that they testified to him, that eternal life is in him, and it's nowhere else. And so for a few moments this morning, what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the amazing archaeological discoveries called the Dead Sea Scrolls. I want to share with you how these writings confirm and corroborate the integrity and the accuracy of the Old Testament even today. And not only that, but because these scrolls were written between 150 B.C. and A.D. 68... There's all of this rich information as well about the people of Palestine who were the neighbors, who were the living contemporaries of John the Baptist, of the apostles, of Jesus Christ, the first generation of Christians. So let's talk about the living word and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I hope that you got one of the programs on the way in because it's going to help us as we go along in the study. On page three, you're going to find an interactive outline for this material. We're going to begin with this question. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Number one in the notes, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? This is a really fun story to go back to, learning about the discovery of these scrolls. Caves were discovered between 1947 and 1956, but here's how it began. About 75 years ago, we're talking, 75 years ago, there were these Bedouins 
tending their flocks on these mountainsides and just northwest of the Dead Sea. And one of the Bedouins, for whatever reason, chucked a rock into a cave and he heard the sound of a crash, a pottery crashing. And he thought, whoops, better go find out what I broke. <laughs> and so he goes up into the cave where he discovers several jars and the one that he had smashed with a rock. And what was in these jars? Scrolls. And he thought, well, this has got to be important to somebody. This might even be worth some money. So he takes them about 13 miles from there to Bethlehem and to Jerusalem, to Antiquities Marcus. He's like, look what I found. And the Antiquities dealer says, yes, these are worth something. And so he bought them. Well, this got him and other Bedouins excited. And frankly, the race was on. People go back to all of these caves in these mountainside of caves in which they found scrolls, okay, there's 600 different caves there. And they start going through caves. It's this fascinating story about strong personalities of archaeologists and scholars, antiquities dealers and governments. And they were all trying to get the scrolls and to display them and to translate them and to date them. And we got all of these different parties working with all these different angles. It was very slow and difficult work. And besides that, it was all happening in a region of the world where there was a whole lot of turmoil. We said that first scroll was found in 1947. Israel becomes a state in 1948. There was a lot of turmoil about that. Israel did not get the land where these caves are located until 1967. So it became challenging to do some of this work. Or there were many challenges about doing all of this work. What happened? What happened beginning in 1947? 2,000-year-old scrolls were discovered in 11 different caves. Out of the 600 caves in that region, 11 yielded written scrolls and documents. And in fact, in the year 2017, they added another cave, Cave 12, because they're still looking around there. And Cave 12 didn't actually have a scroll in it, but what it had was scraps of parchment that they hadn't written on yet and other writing materials, and they realized, well, this goes with the other people too. So got 12 caves, 11 of them have yielded scrolls. In fact, almost 1,050 scrolls have been found in these 11 caves. 1,050 scrolls. Additionally, 60,000 fragments have been recovered. Bits of other scrolls, bits of other writings. Most of the scrolls were written on parchment, okay, which is prepared animal skins. A few were written on papyrus, which is a lot more like paper. And then one was written on copper. It's called the Copper Scroll. They hammered out the words into that one. And if you ever want to learn about the Copper Scroll, you'll like, they ought to make a movie about it because it's a treasure map. They just can't decide if it's real treasure or spiritual treasure. But it's a treasure map written in copper, the Copper Scroll. About 900 separate texts have been identified out of all of this. And I was told that I needed to clarify. These are not texts that have emojis. This is a word that we're talking about, different written documents. Apparently, I confused somebody uh, last hour. So anyway, uh, and I didn't mean to. Okay, but we're talking about ancient scrolls and documents. Hey, this is an impressive library. All hidden away in these caves for 2,000 years. Who wrote them? Why did they write them? Well, those questions led to some other digging and the discovery and excavation of Qumran. This little community, this little town area in 1956 and then a whole lot more in 1967. It was a team of French archaeologists who decided we need to find out who wrote these scrolls. The nearest ruins that ought to be explored is this place called Qumran. It's this settlement built atop a small mesa among these small mountains and caves about 8 miles south of Jericho. 13 miles east of Jerusalem just right above the shores of the Dead Sea. This was a town that had been populated throughout Israel's history. When you go back to the book of uh, Joshua, Joshua chapter 15, verses 61 through 62, the Holy Spirit is laying out through there all the different towns of the land that Israel was inheriting, and one of them is called the City of Salt. And most people believe this is the same place, the same town or community as Qumran because of where it lies geographically, by En Gedi and by the Dead Sea. And so people would have been living there way back then. And certainly people were living there in the days of Jesus in the first century. 
Why is that? Well, basically because there's a spring of water there at Qumran. And just like Jericho and En Gedi, wherever there was water, ancient peoples tended to live and conquer a city but rebuild it on the site and conquer it and rebuild it on the site. And so there's people living at Qumran throughout, highlighted there throughout. In first century Palestine, there were Jews living in a commune. It's not really, the walls aren't really high enough to call it a fortress, and it's not quite big enough to be a town, but it was a commune. People were living together at Qumran. And these people had written a significant library, a significant library. And those same people divided up their library and hid it in at least 11 different caves. Why would they do that? And who are these people? There's the excavations that really started in earnest in 1967. Uh, an artist rendering that kind of shows you some of the features of Qumran. One of the things I'll highlight is that there's a building there called a scriptorium because the people that lived in this town were all about copying religious documents, making books, preserving books. That was part of the deal if you lived in Qumran. Who are these people? Most scholars believe today that it's a group of people who lived at Qumran called the Essenes. And this is a sect of Jews, a sect of Jews described by Josephus, by Pliny the Elder and historians of antiquity, but not one you read of in the New Testament. Isn't that curious? In the New Testament, you read about the Pharisees, and you know about that sect of the Jews, and those were the guys that were in the synagogues, they were all about the scriptures, they get rebuked a lot for adding their traditions to the word of God. And you heard of a sect, you read one in the New Testament called the Sadducees. And these fellows didn't believe in angels and they didn't believe in the resurrection. They had money and they kind of ran things at the temple. And in the New Testament you read about a sect called the Zealots. And these guys were militants. They were about overthrowing Rome, okay? And one of them was even one of the twelve apostles. Simon the Zealot tells you that he was affiliated with this sect called the Zealots. But then there's this other group. They are the Essenes, another Jewish sect. And the Essenes distinguished themselves from the other three. And at least in Qumran, they were living together in isolation, just amongst themselves. And they had reasons for doing that. Between the ancient historians and the documents discovered and studied in these Dead Sea Scrolls, this library, there's a real picture and understanding of the Essenes that has emerged. And I'm going to tell you some of their story and some of their features as we go along. But I want to start right here, quoting from Josephus, that one of the things that stood out about the Essenes was their commitment to their books, was their commitment to their scrolls. Josephus wrote about this, quote, they, the Essenes, also take great pains in studying the writings of the ancients and choose out of them what is most for the advantage of their soul and body. They're about the scrolls and ancient scrolls. They're reading these things. He talked about if you were a candidate and you wanted to become an Essene, you would take vows and there were things that you had to do. Notice what one of the commitments was you made. Quote, moreover, he, that's the guy that wants to be an Essene, moreover, he swears to communicate their doctrines to no one any otherwise than as he received them himself, and he will equally preserve the books belonging to their sect and the names of the angels. He's going to promise to teach exactly what he's been taught. He's going to promise to protect their books, their scrolls, and there's something in here said about angels and the significance of angels. We're going to come back to that. We'll put a pin in that. But right now we're emphasizing the books. Finally, this one. Uh, he talked about how interested they are in prophecy and prophecy from the scriptures. He wrote this, quote, There are also those among them who undertake to foretell things to come by reading the holy books and using several sorts of purification and being perpetually conversant in the discourses of the prophets. So interested in prophecy and reading prophecies, these Essenes. Several books discovered at Qumran are actually commentaries which the Essenes wrote about Bible books you've heard of, particularly prophets like Habakkuk. And they'd give a line from Habakkuk and then they would give the commentary and they would say, it's all about the Essenes. It's all about things going on at Qumran. They were very expectant of the return of Messiah and changes happening even in their own lifetime. But look, when it became clear to the Essenes that Romans were going to conquer all of Judea, 
By A.D. 70, they did, and Jerusalem had been destroyed. They decided, we're going to take our library, and we got to save it. We promised we would. We'll hide it in all of these different caves, and we'll come back to it later. But evidently, none of them lived through the Roman destruction. And so there, those scrolls sat for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years. So from 1947 and following, there's this huge library and even puzzles for translators uh, that has come to light. Some of the books, you get the whole book, like the great Isaiah scroll. And it's called that because it's there. I mean, you, the whole scroll's together. And it goes something like 17 feet long continuously. It's a big scroll. And then you've got other fragments, so it's very challenging to know what they are because there's just little bits of, of words and letters on these little scraps of paper. The analogy is this, if you can imagine trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have the box with the picture on it, and not only that, you're certain you're missing pieces of the picture. So how do you put that together? How does that go together? It's very challenging, isn't it? But be that as it may, where we are today, after 75 years of working on these things, and it is an ongoing work. Like I said, they found a new cave in 2017. And there's interest in launching a whole other archaeological dig in the first 11 caves. Because they said maybe they missed something and we could dig a little deeper. So this is ongoing. Very, very exciting because it's ongoing. But we can classify the scrolls into four groups right now. I'm going to share them with you. The first is this. Number one, biblical scrolls. That is, books have been found. That are the books. In the Bible, we call them the Old Testament books. They're there. 223 examples of that, texts of that. Second, non-sectarian scrolls, their label. What's that mean? These are also religious-themed books, uh, a lot of religious content, but they're not necessarily about being Essenes or not necessarily about living at Qumran, okay? So other religious books, significant books. Number three, the sectarian scrolls, there's 249 of these that really are about what it means to be an Essene and what it means to live at Qumran. That's just about those people right there. And then finally, number four, unidentified. And that one's pretty self-explanatory, I think. That's all that jigsaw puzzle work that still has to be done. What I want to do is consider with you how each of these groups of scrolls, these groups of writings, what it does for our faith in Jesus, who is the living word. The scriptures testify to him. So as we move forward in the notes, number two this morning, we are talking about the biblical scrolls and how the biblical scrolls enhance our confidence and our knowledge in the Bible. It is a really exciting thing, a really great thing, that about 223 of these texts among the Dead Sea Scroll Library are books of the Old Testament. Which means these are the oldest copies of Bible books which exist today. These are the earliest that have come down to us. These copies existed at the time of Christ. Some of them were before that time. And what have we seen? Well, that a, a Hebrew Bible, these books, look the same in Jesus' day as they do in our day. Now, I don't know if this next part would surprise you or not, but when they first started digging out these scrolls, there were people who were so skeptical of what, what would be found in those scrolls. Once we start reading these and translating these, it is going to be the end of Christianity. You're not going to be able to trust this Bible once we learn about these Dead Sea Scrolls. One of these writers is Edmund Wilson, his book, The Scrolls from the Dead Sea, which came out pretty early, uh, like 1955. They were still finding scrolls. But he wrote this, quote, it would seem an immense advantage for cultural and social intercourse, that is, for civilization, that the rise of Christianity should at last be generally understood as simply an episode of human history rather than propagated as dogma and divine revelation. The study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the direction it is now taking, cannot fail, one would think, to conduce this. What's he saying? That we're learning more about these Dead Sea Scrolls and we're going to find out that the Bible is not divine revelation. Christianity is going to go away because this isn't really something from God. There's other reasons to explain these writings. Well, I'll just tell you that now it's been 75 years since they were first discovered. And what we can say is just the opposite has occurred. 
that the Dead Sea Scrolls have provided positive witnesses to the Hebrew canon. Let me show you this chart. Because it's not only that all the books are there in these scrolls, except for Esther, but so many copies of the book. It's really something, but 39 copies of Deuteronomy? 39 copies of the Psalms? None of one of their favorites, Isaiah, and there's a lot of talk about Isaiah. 22 uh, examples of Isaiah. What's that about? Why are there some more than others? One of the scroll experts wrote this. We can usually judge the importance of a text to the community by the number of copies they may have had. The book of Isaiah is one of the most represented books in the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. Another book represented in great numbers is the Psalms, of which 39 copies have been found. 20 copies of the book of Deuteronomy have also been found. Now, 20 is a little different number than what we had on the chart. The chart said 39, and I think the chart had come out perhaps a little after this one was written. But be that as it may, these books were important to the Essenes. And they are so important to us because we can compare all of these copies of these books with the copies that we have from later times, like the Masoretic text that our Old Testaments are translated from in English. And when we do, what we find is this incredible witness to the trustworthy transmission of the Scriptures. I talked about Isaiah, and I talked about this a little bit, what, a couple of weeks ago, about the discovery of the great Isaiah scroll. And it's called that because of its complete, near-complete preservation. There's another 21 copies of Isaiah that they found besides this one, but this is the best preserved. And when you compare that one with this second oldest Hebrew text of the book of Isaiah, which dates to about 1,000 A.D., so there's 1,000 years between these two copies, Dead Sea Scroll, Masoretic, they're virtually identical. There's a few little changes in spelling of words here and there. But what it showed is that for a thousand years, this line-by-line, hand-by-hand transmission process, copying process, was sound, was strong. What it showed was that uh, writing copies of Scripture was not like playing games of telephone. All right, you ever have to do that when you were in kindergarten and you sit in a big circle and somebody starts a message and, and they whisper in your ear, Susie's cute. It goes all the way around. What was the message? Bobby's a dog. That wasn't the message, right? And we all laughed. We love playing telephone. And people said, well, that's how it was with hand copying these manuscripts. You can't trust them. You can absolutely trust them. It's nothing like playing a game of telephone. Nothing was changed, particularly in the book of Isaiah, to try to write Jesus into the Old Testament or write his deeds, his sayings, his prophecies into the Old Testament. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, uh, in verses 32 through 35, there's this Ethiopian treasure traveling along, and, and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading it out loud. And what is he reading? He's reading from the 50, 53rd chapter. And he asks a question of Philip, the evangelist, of who does the prophet speak of himself or another man? And Philip was able to start at that scripture and preach Jesus to him. That is so powerful. To know that the same scrolls that that Ethiopian treasure we're reading are the same ones reflected in these Dead Sea Scrolls that we have in our Bibles even today. There's not been change. Trustworthy transmission. All right. Second, the Dead Sea Scrolls have aided in our clarification, excuse me, aided and provided clarification in translation. Let's make sure we're translating these things correctly. And, I, and I'll give you an example of this from Psalm 22 in verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Well, Psalm 22, verse 16, that's in nearly every list of messianic psalms you're going to find about Jesus' crucifixion. Um, a note, though, in modern translations, if you're looking at a page in your Bible there, you might see the note. A note in modern translations has stumbled some people and solidified some skeptics in opposition to the biblical text. The note indicates that a majority reading of the Masoretic text renders Psalm 22, verse 16, like the lion, my hands and my feet. That there's a different word there. It shouldn't say pierce. It should say, like the lion, my hands and my feet. The difference is this. 
in the Septuagint translation and other early translations, they were rendering a Hebrew word, ka'aru, which means pierced. But why is there a note in your English Bible? Because in the majority Masoretic text, it's this Hebrew word, ka'ari, like a lion. So what should it say? Like a lion, my hands and my feet? Or should it say pierced my hands and my feet? Now evidently, the oldest and majority Masoretic texts, they have like a lion. These ancient translations, they say pierced. And the question becomes, were all of these ancient translations deliberately mistranslating and creating the word pierced, maybe even to fit gospel accounts? Or, Or were they just working with Hebrew manuscripts that actually had the word karu And a copyist just missed a mark, changed a little line accidentally, and then you get a Masoretic reading. So they go back and they read this in all the different examples of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what did they find? Jewish scholar Dr. Michael L. Brown wrote this, quote, The oldest Hebrew copy of the Psalms we possess from the Dead Sea Scrolls dating to the century before Yeshua reads the verb in this verse as karu, not kari like a lion. A reading also found in about a dozen medieval Masoretic manuscripts. Now that may not settle the discussion altogether, but it sure gives a whole lot of weight that that it's pierced. Or there's a lot, a, a significant group of ancient scrolls, and they had it as pierced. Now let's go on. All of this to say the importance, the incredible importance of the Old Testament scriptures being accurate, being reliable, For the sake of the truth of the New Testament. Which rests upon the Old Testament so heavily. It relies so much on the Old Testament. Scripture is the true. It is unbreakable. It is the very word of God. And the Old Testament demonstrates this. Which gives all the more weight then. When New Testament writings are called scripture. That they carry the same characteristics of these Old Testament books. And brethren, I'll say this, that we do well today to understand and to learn from the Old Testament too. To spend time in these books. It does not take away from Jesus. It makes us wise unto salvation in Jesus Christ. And the message of Jesus and the apostles was, because these Old Testament scriptures are true, because this Hebrew Bible is trustworthy, because all of it's true, that's why you ought to believe in me. That's why you ought to follow me. I'm the fulfillment of these things. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, like so much of archaeology and Bible lands, it's just been a great friend of the Bible. It has not been the destruction of the Bible. Um, Let's go on. Number three, I want to spend a moment talking about the non-sectarian and the sectarian scrolls because what they do is they enhance our understanding of the first century world. This environment and these groups of people where John the Baptist is preaching and Jesus is preaching and all the first Christians, right? And we actually gain information about what that world looked like and what another group of people were like in that place. Two other sets of scrolls related in the habits of the Qumran. Okay, non-sectarian. What is that? I'll give you a couple of examples. These are mostly religious books, not strictly about the Essenes and their beliefs and practices. So, one example is the temple scroll. You'll read a lot about this. It's all about the temple. It's all about its construction. It's all about the sacrifices that are supposed to be going on at the temple. In these scrolls, there's writings about calendars, dealing with what calendar we should go by, and when religious festivals are supposed to be observed, like Passover and Hanukkah. Another example, the angelic liturgy. We'll talk about that for a moment. What has been found is this collection of hymns and prayers seemingly by angels to God. And the discussion is, okay, were these prayers and songs written, uh, the people kind of sing along with angels, was that the idea? Or were these psalms and songs and prayers that people were praying to angels? Remember, there was something about these Essenes and angels that even caught Josephus' attention. He needed a remark about that. And so a lot of people think that there was all kind of mysticism and angel worship that was going on with the Essenes. All right. Then you have the sectarian books. This is about being an Essene. This is about living there in Qumran in the community. An example of that. The rule of the community. A very large work. About being an Essene. About living at Qumran. It talks about membership. And how you're going to be a member. The vows you got to take. The feast days they observe. 
interesting, we learn in this scroll that the Essenes called themselves the sons of light. And people who were not Essenes, well, they're the sons of darkness. And the sons of light curse the sons of darkness. You want to be one of the sons of light. That's very interesting. There's a section called the congregational rule in this work, which contains all the rules they're going to follow when the Messiah appears, because the Essenes are going to line up with the Messiah, and they're going to go with him. So what's that life going to look like? There's a lot of other stuff besides that. There's the Damascus document, which gives this history of all of Israel, and then it calls the Essenes to live true to their calling. There's rules in this document about the Sabbath, rules for women and for children. And so evidently, while some of the people that lived in Qumran might have been celibate, others did have wife and kids, had to, had to learn how to rear them, okay? And then finally, the war scroll. And this is all about the battle between good and evil in the last days. And while there is this ongoing spiritual battle between good and evil, in the last days, some exciting stuff is going to happen. According to the Essenes, these two figures are going to appear. One is called the teacher of righteousness, and he's going to have a job of setting the priesthood straight, teach a bunch of truth, okay? And then the other is the Messiah, after David's line, a Davidic Messiah, and that Messiah... He is going to lead them in a physical victory to destroy all of the nations around them and set up a kingdom at Jerusalem. So the Essenes were looking for two figures, two end times figures to go fight in this war of righteousness against evil. Well, thank you all for being awake as I catch my breath. And you're saying, Andrew, why are you taking us down all of these scrolls? Because John the Baptist was preaching. In the wilderness of Judea. Because Jesus was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Because Christians and Christian teaching was going on all over Judea. And we need to understand there were Essenes in the mix. There were people that believed these things and were teaching these things. They're in the mix. One Qumran scholar wrote this, quote, The scrolls offer backlighting on the New Testament that aids considerably in understanding parts of it. The information of some of the Qumran works all allows one to interpret a series of New Testament passages in a fuller way with a greater appreciation for them against the backdrop of their time and world. So let me highlight, let me give give you three things here about how kind of learning Qumran and learning about these things, probably the Essenes, when we appreciate some things about them, it gives us a fuller understanding of some of the messages going on in this gospel teaching and preaching. What do you mean? Well, okay, the Essenes, the liturgy of the angels. Were these mystical angel worshipers, or were some of them? Was that going on in Judea? Well, when you read in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, the apostle Paul is warning Christians against Judaizing teachers and Judaizing influences. And we see that real clearly in verse 16. In Colossians 2 and verse 16, it says, So let no, none, uh, no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. And we're like, oh, well, that's, that's all Judaism. Can't judge you about that. But then it goes on. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility. Some of your versions say asceticism there. It's taking delight in asceticism and worship of angels... Intruding into those things which he has not seen. Vainly puffed up with a fleshly mind. Maybe that's been a a sort of a curious thing to us. But appreciate, if this is going on with the Essenes, this is more Jewish influence. This is more Judaizing with the asceticism, with angel worship. There's a lot of teaching in Hebrews chapter 1 about Jesus over and against angels. Isn't that a curious thing? we got to lay out and talk about how the Son of God is higher than angels. For a little while, he becomes lower than the angels, but then he's glorified above the angels. Why do we wrestle with that? And yet, if there's uh, angelic liturgy going on among some people, we got to do some teaching about this. Notice, as the teaching goes throughout the uh, Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 4 through 6 quotes from the book of Psalms, 2 Samuel, the book of Deuteronomy. Hebrews 1 verse 7 quotes from Psalm 104 verse 4. Hebrews 1 verse 13 is quoting from uh, Psalm 110 verse number 1. 
It's going to the Psalms to say, look at the Christ. Now, could you take this outline and go up to Qumran and preach it? You know, as a matter of fact, you could. They had 39 copies of the Psalms around there. Let's go search the scriptures and let's learn who Jesus is. You can do that at Qumran. I'll give you another one. Uh, the two prophetic figures. I explained this to you just a moment ago. They're looking for a teacher of righteousness. In fact, their idea was that the Essenes had begun in the long ago by a fellow named or called teacher of righteousness who had been wrongfully put to death. And so he's going to come back like a resurrection. He's going to come back and the Messiah is going to be there too. And we're going to have war and we're going to win. Two guys. They're looking for two guys. Well, interesting when Jesus is asked by the rich young ruler who was not an Essene because he was rich. He was asked by the rich young ruler, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. Well, I'm a teacher, but I'm much more, right? A good teacher. But there's people looking for a teacher of righteousness. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, in verse number 10, which is the woes against the Pharisees, but he says, call no one teacher, for one is your teacher, the Christ. That's the word that means Messiah. One is your teacher, that is, the Christ. Well, think about that. One teacher is the Christ. These Essenes were saying, well, we got a teacher, and then we got a Christ. No, no. One teacher is the Christ. Even the apostles, as they come along and preach the Messiah, who was a descendant of David, but instead of being this earthly conqueror, he's a spiritual king. He dies. He dies upon a cross. And then he's resurrected. You recall what Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He dies on the cross. He rises again. This is all according to God's plan. And what's his text? Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11. In Acts 2, 34 through 36, when he draws his conclusion that Jesus is both Lord and Christ... He quotes again from Psalm 110 and verse number 1. Could you take Peter's outline? Could you take the Pentecost message and go up to Qumran and explain to them about how there's actually one Messiah and the death and the resurrection? Yeah, you can. Because i got 39 copies of the Psalms. Let's search those out and preach this and understand this. What was it the Essenes wanted to be called? They identified as sons of light. Sons of light. That sounds good. We all want to be sons of light. But what the Apostle Paul teaches us by inspiration in Ephesians chapter 5 is that you are sons of light in Christ. You are sons of light in Christ. And then it gives a, a little poetry, what some people think is a hymn. And that's actually an allusion to Isaiah 26, 19 and Isaiah 60, verse 1. You got to go back and, and read over that. Could Christian preachers come along and teach the people of Qumran? I know you want to be sons of light. You've got to be sons of light in Christ. Let me show you Christ from the book of Isaiah. Yeah, they had a lot of Isaiah. We take Isaiah. Let's search Isaiah and talk about Jesus Christ. My point is that a significant portion of apostolic preaching was showing how Jesus fulfilled all of these messianic prophecies from Old Testament Scripture. And then when you learn about the Essenes from these Dead Sea Scroll documents, it really shows how the proofs in the New Testament speak even broader than maybe we first realized and speak to the hopes and, and even correct some of the traditions of this other Jewish sect, the Essenes. When the gospel is preached to the Jew first, none of the Jews of that day are overlooked to the Jew first and then the Greek. Let's look at the last group of scrolls. The unidentified. The unidentified. So, you know, we're living here in this wonderful year of 2021. And it's good in this Dead Sea Scroll discussion because for over 20 years, everyone's kind of had the scrolls and had access to the scrolls. It wasn't always like that. And since it took 50 years to get the scrolls published, there were all of these rumors and conspiracies and... and uh, controversial theories and books going out about what the meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls really is. And uh, they said, once you get it all translated, you'll never trust the Bible again. 1991, Michael Bajan's book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception. 
And that was the purpose of his book. Look, if we ever get all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it'll be the end of Christianity. But you know why you won't? Because the Catholics are keeping them away from us. They don't want us to know the truth. Very controversial. Sell a lot of copies. Uh, a year later, 1992, Barbara Thiering's book, Jesus the Man. And here is a lady that said, once you get all the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls actually become a cipher, a code by which we can lay it on top of the New Testament. Now we can really read the New Testament. And once we really read the New Testament, we're going to find out that Jesus faked his death, faked his resurrection, was married, it didn't work out, he got divorced, he's got three kids. It was all there. Very controversial. Very controversial. So a lot of copies. A lot of imagination, a lot of controversy, all of it suggesting that somehow Christianity is done once we get all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, by the end of the 1990s, you have all the Dead Sea Scrolls. Christianity was not destroyed. Our confidence in the Bible was built up. But let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about another controversy, which goes in the other direction. This one is not that uh, uh, Christianity is destroyed by the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what if, what if, What if the Dead Sea Scrolls include a first-generation copy of the Gospel of Mark? What if they found some of Mark in those caves as well? There's a working theory among some Dead Sea Scroll experts about unique fragments found in Cave 7 at Qumran. They're different than all the others. How are they different? Well, for one thing, they're written in Greek. Greek letters. Everything else written in Hebrew. For another thing, they're written on papyrus. They're written on the paper, not the parchments, not the animal skins, like everything else. And they seem to date right towards the end of the community. Well, people have suggested uh, that these scraps of papyrus are actually words from the Gospel of Mark. I'll give you a couple of pictures here. 7Q5, which means we found this in the 7th cave at Qumran. Exhibit number 5. And 7Q6, 7th cave at Qumran. Here's exhibit number 6. And could this be Mark chapter 6, verses 52 and 53? Could this be Mark 4, verse 28? Spanish scholar Jose O'Callaghan in 1972 wrote an academic article contending 7Q5 was in fact Mark 6, 52 and 53. Another German scholar by the name of Karsten Peter Thiede, he wrote a book about this. And here's how he translated it, quote, understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened, and when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there, and when they got, you say, how did I get all that sentence from, how do you do that, all right, how, how do you do that? Well, uh, his theory is basically this, you know, if you have the whole scroll of Mark in front of you, and you kind of rip a piece this way, If you put that back in there, this piece is going to supply the letters and kind of the missing word in about three or four lines there. And it fits right in there. Interesting theory. Controversial. I'm going to back up because I did want to point out, I've got a little ruler on this slide, even though you may not be able to see it, but it's an MM, millimeters. So when we're talking about these particular fragments, think about the, the size of your thumb or something like that. These are very small. It's very, very challenging to read this. But anyway, the, the case is being made. And um, that's kind of the way it worked. Very controversial. But he wrote a book about it. The earliest gospel manuscript in uh, 1992. In 2006, much more recently, a Dead Sea scholar, Robert Eisman, he wrote a book where he was arguing. He, he said, I'm not so sure about those particular uh, text being uh, Mark, rather, but he said, I I just look at all of this stuff going on at Qumran, and I think there was Christians at Qumran. I think it might have been an entirely uh, Christian community, which is kind of interesting. It's a whole different sort of controversy, isn't it? A whole different sort of controversy. I got a book on my shelf, the Dead Sea Scrolls, or understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it said unequivocally, there's no New Testament documents found in the Dead Sea. Dead Sea Scrolls, quote, no actual copies of New Testament books have been found at Qumran, period. I got another book on my shelf. (laughs) This one was 2016. He says, wait, we're talking about all this stuff. 
uh, in the context, talking about the Mark, the Mark fragment there, 7Q5, there is much debate over this, and most experts refute the claim. They do not think that these fragments refer to the Gospels, but there is much similarity between the Qumran beliefs and those of the early Christians. Important, well-known scroll researchers believe they were identical, that is, the Qumran sect was part of the early Christian community. That was a revolutionary idea in scroll research, uh, scholarship when it was first voiced, but evidence may be mounting in favor of it. At present, few scroll researchers go along with the view, but I think the tide will start to change. Here's a fellow that thinks there might be something to this theory. My point is, it's possible and it's controversial. I doubt it'd ever be proved, but it's been said and it's out there and there's people still thinking about it. Some more fragments discovered or assembled would sure help a lot. But I tell you what it is about this theory of Mark. It's a lot more straightforward to say, well, if the scroll ripped this way, this is what we'd have left, than to say, take all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, make it a cipher and a special matrix through which we read the Bible, and now we understand it all completely. I think that's a lot more far-fetched. Different kind of controversy. This one highly favors Christianity. And wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? And now you have a controversy that suggests actually fragments of the New Testament are in Qumran. And actually there were Christians in Qumran. You know, for us, there wouldn't be any big surprise about Christians being in Qumran in AD 68 at the time it fell because the gospel was preached throughout all Judea. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to the apostles, you will be my witnesses throughout All Judea. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 4, when the persecution came, we're told that the disciples were scattered throughout all Judea. And they went everywhere preaching the word. This community is only 13 miles away from Jerusalem. It's in Judea. We're told in Galatians 1, verses 22 through 24, there were churches throughout Judea. Now, we're not told about the church at Qumran. It's not mentioned there specifically. The New Testament doesn't speak to this town. What does it do? It follows Philip and his preaching. and He went down to Samaria and how that worked out. And the Ethiopian treasure. And, and we understand all that. But there was people preaching throughout all Judea. And preaching at Qumran in AD 35 to this little group, this little commune. I don't know. It might have been like preaching to a whole town of Solitarsus. And it was rough going. But it might have also been preaching to people who had been looking for the fulfillment of the scriptures And you could demonstrate that in Jesus Christ. It could have looked like that. What if one such church was in Qumran? Maybe not the whole community, but but maybe some Christians. Well, so what? If Mark or other New Testament books were uncovered at Qumran, so what? Well, it would be the earliest manuscript evidence for a New Testament book. That's good. It would probably weigh into the debate about which New Testament book was written first, Matthew or Mark. I think it would be a nail in the coffin for skeptics who have said that the miracles of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus are all a bunch of, uh, you know, legend and lore that were written by people decades after, centuries after, because this is written so early. And there's probably some other consequences I can't even imagine. But now you go to the other side of the coin. If Mark or some other New Testament book is not at Qumran, if that could never be proved, so what? No big deal. The New Testament loses nothing. We stand right where we're standing today with the greatest confidence that God has given his word and preserved his word down to us today. We stand upon the truth that the 66 books of the Bible are scripture and that the scripture testifies to Jesus in him and in him alone is eternal life, which is where we began. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. The scriptures testify to Jesus Christ. He's the living word. It's true, it's active, it's abiding, it's sufficient, it's effectual. The word of God. We have it faithfully before us today in our Bibles. And my hope that spending a little bit of time Considering the living word in the Dead Sea Scrolls has uh, 
encouraged you greatly in the confidence of the living word and the scriptures that testify to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for your good attention. If you want to put your Bibles away, put your notes away. Brother Stephen's going to come forward and lead us in another song. What we call a song of invitation or a song of encouragement, and that is for the person who is ready to answer this testimony to Jesus Christ in his word. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Confess your faith that he is the son of God. Repent of sin in your life and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Be baptized into Jesus to leave here a son of light, a child of light truly in Christ. We can help you this morning to leave here in Christ. We invite you to come forward and make the desire known now. Together we stand and sing. Won't you come?